And that sort of leads over to sources too, where it's like one part that um, you're, you're already hinting at that you were, you're reading through these materials. It was like, it was, it, all these dots existed and it was just sort of for somebody to connect them. And in part, I kind of want to, especially for like students who may watch this, kind of think about where do you find the material? Obviously, we don't have like the five o'clock news that has the weather report or even the newspaper that doesn't have a weather page. So where do you find uh, information about weather? Well, let me, let me, let me explain how I did this. Um, when I decided to do this topic, the first thing I did is I went to the Auburn Library and checked out a couple of books on Fort Sumter. And I read my way through Fort Sumter again. And I create, I started creating two documents. I had one document that actually listed weather conditions at Fort Sumter. I had no idea that Fort Sumter was hit by a nor'easter the second night of the bombardment, which I thought was really interesting. It actually stops the bombardment for a while. But I also looked at, at the sources. I mean, another thing that we teach students, you and I teach students, everybody I hope teaches students is data mining. Where do other historians get their material? I did some data mining and I said, okay, where is this scholar getting his information about weather? And it actually turns out that most scholars who write uh, campaign history, at least, will generally rely on three or four or five sources for mm -hmm. their information. So I started building a bibliography of those sources, those primary sources, except uh, instead of just reading what John Smith said about Fort Sumter. I read everything John Smith wrote in hopes that he would continue to be weather observant throughout the war. I actually built a pretty large bibliography that way. But in a way, the idea wasn't to build a large bibliography, it was to build a, a good but limited bibliography. Because as anybody who's done civil war research knows, soldiers like to write about the weather. They don't always do it very accurately, they usually don't have a thermometer but they liked to write about the weather. And there was a real danger, I thought, of being overwhelmed. And I just started going to archives and say, hey, give me a hundred weather collections so I can see what these guys say about the weather. I had to, to limit that. Mm -hmm. But I wanted to limit it to really good sources. So that's how I approached it qualitatively. And I ended up looking at uh, 470 voices. Uh, 420 soldiers and 50 civilians. Um, and I think I've built a pretty good sample. I have no doubt that anybody watching this will say, I can't believe you didn't include Stephen Smith, who wrote this wonderful description of Wilson's Creek. And that's probably true. Yeah. But I, I feel good about the sample. But that's still pretty inexact. So I was started looking for hard data. And it's interesting that there is quite a bit of hard data out there about weather. It's frustrating in the Civil War years, but it does exist. In the 1840s, uh, certain American scientists um, and the Smithsonian Institution uh, started developing theories about the weather. Uh, weather's, uh, weather knowledge at that time suggested that weather was basically local. Uh, which is why if you know, it didn't rain on your corn crop, you could, you could pray enough and maybe you know, rain would come. In the 1840s, we're starting to see theories that weather in one part of the country or one part of the world is related to what's happening sometimes. So how do you prove that in an era that doesn't have computers and you're just starting to see the telegram? Uh, the Smithsonian commissioned a national system of weather observers and agreed to send them instruments and forms and instructions if these observers would promise to go out and make weather observations three times a day, 7 a.m., 2 p.m., and 9 p.m., compile this information. And eventually the idea was that somebody would take all of this information and compare it. Um, they called it synoptic meteorology. You know, in the same way that we go through the four Gospels looking for common points or you know, where Mark differs from John. Um, synoptic meteorology, the idea was we're going to sit down and we're going to say, oh, look, there was a storm in Chattanooga and two days later there was a similar storm in Richmond. Something's happening. Now. Right. That system largely fell apart in the Confederacy during the war. Uh, 
which led to all sorts of frustrations for me. It didn't fall apart completely. There are some remarkable people who keep compiling this data. Uh, there's a professor in Clarksville, Tennessee. There's a formerly enslaved man in Natchez, Mississippi, who becomes the official weather observer for the Smithsonian Institution in Natchez, part of the slave society. There's, there's this former slave doing this. They're, they're fascinating people. So, but it's not complete. It's complete in the North, which was, was helpful for me when I was trying to put together more continental weather patterns. You've also got newspapers sometimes um, providing weather information, individuals, um, and the military, the army, um, at, at established bases, surgeons were supposed to keep weather information. Uh, naval officers on ships were supposed to compile hard data. They were usually very good about that in the Blue Water Navy and really horrible about that in the other rivers, which frustrated the heck out of me because um, I would sometimes yell at them, why didn't you write down the temperature that day? But in short, there's a lot of hard data out there. And really, it was just a question of trying to use that as well. So most of this is at National Archives Studio in College Park. The military data is there as well. The naval, naval ship logs are at that main campus downtown Washington. And I just made a lot of photocopies and compiled this and started doing what people like Joseph Espy wanted us to do, which was to start comparing this data. Hmm. So as a result, and here I, I should say that I'm really building on something that Bob Crick did in his book, Civil War Weather in Virginia. He's the first one who really used this data and introduced me and I think a lot of us to the fact that it existed. We can get a really good handle on what hard weather data exists for the Virginia theater, for the Eastern theater. It's a little iffier in the West. It's, it's really iffy in the Trans-Mississippi. But there is hard data as well as soldiers. So, you know, if you've got a soldier saying, gee, it was really hot that day, you can also see that in Georgetown District of Columbia that day, it was 94 degrees. Hmm. So it was probably something very comparable to that, that Cedar Mountain, for example. So that's the kind of, kind of research I did. As I was writing the book, I, I ran across a couple of holes where I really didn't have data. So I went looking for additional voices. But that's what I really tried to do. I tried to balance the, the classic soldier data that I've used in previous mm -hmm. projects, that, that soldier material, um, with this hard data that we have. And that has been very, very underutilized um, by scholars in their profession. It's there. Mm -hmm. 